Now at 5 and streaming on CrossroadsToday.com, an update in the San Antonio murder mystery that left a pregnant teen and her boyfriend dead. And tragedy unfolds in a prairie, Iowa, after school shooting that leaves two dead and several hurt. Plus, a man faces six charges after he is chased down by Victoria County Sheriff's deputies. And the wind are with us now. We've got a fast moving cold front. It's already out in West Texas. You see right about there it should be arriving overnight. So uh, the rain probably will begin after midnight. So let's get ready for that one. We'll talk more about it coming up in just a few minutes. The legal battle at the southern border continues as the Department of Justice sues Texas over its new controversial immigration law. You're watching 25 News Now at 5. Good afternoon and thanks for being with us. I'm Karina Garcia. Police say a gunman killed a sixth grade student and wounded five other people today at Prairie High School in Iowa. Police identified the gunman as 17 year old Dylan Butler. Butler, who Dallas County Sheriff's deputies say found him with a self inflicted gunshot wound, has died. The five wounded victims include four students and one administrator. One is in critical condition but has non threatening conditions, while the others are all in stable condition. Authorities found an improvised explosive device during their search of the school and rendered it safe. Today had been the first day back for students after the winter break. We have an update on the murder mystery in San Antonio that left a pregnant teen and her boyfriend dead. Police arrested a teen and his father Wednesday in connection to the deaths of 18 year old Savannah Soto and 22 year old Matthew Guerra. 19 year old Christopher Preciado is accused of killing the couple during a drug deal gone wrong. His bond has been set at $1 million. His dad, Raymond Preciado, is accused of trying to get rid of the bodies in a parked vehicle. His bond is set at $100,000. Police found the couple's bodies in a parked car near an apartment complex just last month. Back in Victoria County, 27 year old Darren Sherman of Houston was taken into custody by Victoria County Sheriff's deputies this Thursday morning. The arrest came after a brief chase following a traffic stop at US Highway 59 near, near Burrowsville Road. Deputies spiked the tires on Sherman's vehicle, but he continued to drive on the rims until he crashed. Sherman is in the Victoria County Jail with Albon facing six charges, including engaging in organized criminal activity. Victoria County Sheriff's deputies arrested 48 year old Nicole Harrell Wednesday. She was arrested on the 200 block of North Bridge Street. Harrell is charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. She is in the Victoria County Jail in lieu of a $50,000 bond. The Victoria Office of Emergency Management is continuing to look into the source of a strong odor in Victoria County and the surrounding areas. The odor was first reported in the southwest region of Victoria County. Victoria County is monitoring the situation. In Hallettsville, police made an arrest after a traffic stop in the 100 block of West 4th Street Tuesday. The driver of the vehicle, 27 year old John Cook of Oma, was found to have an outstanding full extradition felony warrant for cattle theft. Cook was arrested and is in the Lavaca County Jail in lieu of $25,000 bond. And now let's take a look at your forecast with Chief Meteorologist Mac Perez. Mac, I stepped outside and I could feel the gust of wind, a cold one too at yeah, that. Yeah, it's a little breezy out there and all this is because the frontal system is coming in faster than earlier expected. In fact, I thought it'd be in after midnight, but you can see it right there. It's in far west Texas, You're right about there. It is already producing rain in Midland. And that will be here after midnight tonight. So tomorrow morning, it'll be a little soggy out there. How long will it last? We'll have all that coming up in just a moment. Mac, thank you. The Department of Justice has sued Texas to challenge an immigration law that would give state authorities the power to detain and deport migrants suspected of crossing the U.S. Mexico border illegally. As this all plays out, House Speaker Mike Johnson led a delegation of 64 Republicans to the southern border, calling the situation there, quote, an unmitigated disaster. A growing number of border challenges unfolding in court. The Department of Justice now suing the state of Texas over its immigration law that would give state officials broad powers to arrest, prosecute and deport migrants suspected of illegally crossing into the state. 
the DOJ calling the law set to take effect in March unconstitutional. Republican Governor Greg Abbott firing back online saying, I like my chances. Texas is the only government in America trying to stop illegal immigration. It marks the second legal action against the state this week after the Biden administration asked the U.S. Supreme Court to allow Border Patrol agents to cut through razor wire fencing Texas placed strategically on private land along the southern border to deter illegal border crossing. Governor Abbott's uh, razor wire does not prevent. It does not prevent non-citizens from unlawfully crossing. That's not what it does. If anything, it puts at risk, it puts the lives of the Border Patrol at risk. Amid record-breaking numbers of migrant encounters last month, numbers have dropped in recent days, prompting several key ports of entry from California to Texas to reopen today. One of those, Eagle Pass, Texas, where House Speaker Mike Johnson led a delegation of more than 60 House Republicans on Wednesday. The situation here and across the country is truly unconscionable. Johnson demanding the president back the GOP's border security legislation, which would resume construction of the border wall and limit the Department of Homeland Security's ability to grant migrants parole. The White House calling Johnson's recent trip a political stunt, blaming Republicans for rejecting President Biden's supplemental funding package, which includes money to bolster personnel at the border. The White House says negotiations for a new bipartisan border security package are headed in the right direction. But Senate leaders admit there are still many differences that need to be worked out before they can reach a deal. In Washington, M. Wynn, ABC News. Here's your viewer poll this afternoon. You can scan that QR code right there on your screen to vote now. The question is, do you think Texas's new immigration law is unconstitutional? Yes, no, or you're not sure? We want to hear your opinion on this. Come to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to take part. And we're going to have an update on 25 News Now at 6. In Arizona, a border crossing has reopened after a month-long closure. The Lipville report of entry resumed operations just this morning. U.S. Customs and Border Protection closed the pedestrian and vehicle crossings on December 4th amid the ongoing migrant surge. At the time, Border Patrol said it needed to adjust personnel to help officials take migrants into custody. Operations at other ports of entry also resumed today, including the Eagle Pass International Bridge and the one in West Crossing in California. An American Airlines flight diverted to Amarillo Wednesday due to a disruptive passenger. An American Airlines spokesperson said flight 1497 from Dallas-Fort Worth to Bozeman had diverted to Amarillo. Law enforcement met the aircraft and officials said the customer had to exit the plane. The plane later redeparted after the customer left. Authorities said the suspect was booked into Randall County Jail and is expected to make his first appearance in court tomorrow. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click that notification bell. For now, stay with us. One group has claimed responsibility for the deadly blast in Iran that killed and injured over 100 people. That's straight ahead on 25 News Now at 5. Also ahead, a man is facing new charges after attacking a judge during his sentencing hearing.
An Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for two explosions in Iran that killed nearly 100 people. The group posted a statement taking credit for the attack. Sources have not been able to confirm that the ISIS offshoot is responsible for these bombings. However, a senior U.S. official said it resembled, quote, the type of thing we've seen ISIS do in the past, unquote. Wednesday's explosions took place during a ceremony to commemorate a top Iranian commander who had been killed in the January of 2020 by a U.S. drone strike in Baghdad. As Japan continues to recover from the devastating earthquakes that struck that country earlier this week, the country's Self-Defense Forces transport vessel has delivered relief aid to a quake-ravaged area today. The aid includes food and bulldozers to the affected area. A series of earthquakes, including a magnitude of 7.6 earthquake, happened January 1st. 78 people have been confirmed dead as a result of the earthquakes. Today, a group of Illinois voters asked the State Board of Elections to take Donald Trump off the 2024 ballot. That makes Illinois the latest state where the former president faces a challenge to his candidacy under the 14th Amendment's insurrectionist ban. The group wants Trump barred from appearing on the primary and general election ballots because of his role in the January 6 U.S. Capitol attack. A decision from the high court could settle that matter for the entire nation soon. Now, this was the moment a man attacked a judge during a sentencing hearing on Wednesday. Before the judge could even finish speaking, 30-year-old Zora Redden rushed towards her and then attacked her. Several district court marshals tried to stop him before the video ended. In a statement, officials said the judge experienced some injuries and is currently being monitored. The man is now facing new charges, including one felony charge of battery on a protected person, resulting in substantial bodily harm and three other misdemeanor battery charges. Well, a 2023 survey by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine found that one third of people reported occasionally or regularly sleeping in separate rooms to accommodate a bed partner. But the health experts say this so-called sleep divorce can either be helpful or hurtful. It's a blast from the past, <laughs> an old trend gaining new traction in homes across the U.S. Sleeping separately from your partner. Sleep divorce, and I don't really like that name because it suggests, you know, divorce sounds so dire. Um, but we want to achieve sleep compatibility, so it doesn't need to be an all or nothing solution. Psychotherapist Robbie Ludwig says sleep is a critical part of overall health, those who don't get their recommended Z's can be more vulnerable to certain medical conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular problems, even dementia. But she says sleeping in separate beds can impact intimacy. If you'd like to try the trend, she advises to go for it on an as-needed basis. If you have a big business meeting or if you find during the week it's really important for you to have good sleep, you know, you can find that you maybe have separate sleep for a period of time and then sleep together on the weekends. If you do sleep separately, Ludwig says to find time to be intimate and to connect with one another. And if you're not sleeping through the night when together, she says to make sure something else isn't at play. If you find that there's no medical reason for it and there doesn't appear to be some psychological conflict underlying the separate sleeping issues, you know, then you can figure out a plan that makes sense for both of you. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Pet owners may want to take a closer look inside the pantry. Blue Ridge Beef announced an expansion of its multi-state cat and dog food recall. Two pound bags of Blue Ridge's kitten grind and kitten mix and puppy mix are being pulled from the shelves due to salmonella and listeria contamination. This can cause the same symptoms in pets as humans, including fever and vomiting. So far, no illnesses have been reported, but the products in question went into stores in 16 states during the last two months of 2023. Good afternoon, everyone. The cloud cover is here. It's kind of windy. What's going on? Well, we're getting ready for that frontal system, which is coming in a lot faster than earlier expected. Right about now, we're at 60 degrees because of a strong east wind at about 18 miles an hour. We managed to get up to 63. That was our high temperature. But even though we've got a frontal system coming in, it's got rain 
probably after midnight. So we'll be talking more about that coming up in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We've got a fairly strong wind out there right about now. You can see it's out coming out of the east, southeast. This is the Gulf moisture sort of returning back to the area and piling up on top of us just as we get ready for that frontal system. The cloud deck is with us, uh, but it's you know not particularly cold. What's going on? Well, the frontal system is already uh, moving through San Angelo and Del Rio. As a result, the shower activity has already begun in West Texas and the snow Yes, it's snowing in Amarillo right about now, uh, is also developing. We'll take a closer look at it. Nothing happening in the uh, crossroads, but as you can see, you go up I-10, you've got thunder showers already developing in the Midland area and farther south. Even Del Rio is getting uh, some rain right about now. To the north, uh, above, uh, the, above Lubbock, so in Amarillo, they're getting snow all the way up to the Texas Panhandle, uh, but most of this, of course, will be a snow activity. Now, we expected this. Now, this rain is moving in this direction, and I'm thinking that it's moving so quickly, it could be here shortly after midnight, so it starts tonight. Now, Future Tracker, how much rain are we going to get out of this? Well, we go all the way through Saturday, which is this frontal system, and you can see how we may actually get uh, up to an inch. So half an inch to an inch is going to be good in green. Remember, if you get to blue, that means that we have uh, over an inch and maybe up to two. So uh, we'll certainly watch that. But looks like a, a significant amount of rain coming in. So what time? All right, well, Future Tracker will tell you. First of all, we start off at 5 p.m. We go forward to midnight. What does that look like to you? All right, midnight shower activity up and down. Uh, heaviest uh, stuff obviously up in Dallas and along I-35, but showers beginning for our area as well. Here's uh, midnight. And then we go through sunrise and you can see how we're still getting the shower activity here. Heavier stuff now moving offshore. And then we go from uh, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, all the way into Friday night, and you can see how that stuff blows away fairly quickly. So it went from six, well, let's see, from midnight, 
till about noon tomorrow. And then after that, it uh, blows away and we uh, actually clear up very nicely uh, for the next couple of days. In fact, we are looking at uh, a good looking weekend after this Friday frontal system comes through. So let's take a look at uh, a little bit longer term. We're looking at Sunday here and we're watching and waiting because although our Sunday will be good, this is the frontal system that will blow through here on Monday. Back to back storms. Now again, we don't have any problems in uh, terms of warnings or advisories, although there is a uh, small craft advisory because of the wind. Up here uh, in the Amarillo, they've got all kinds of winter weather advisories as winter has definitely arrived up there. Overnight lows getting down to only about 60, which is where we are right now. And then tomorrow we'll actually get up to about 70 degrees before all that, uh, shall we say, drier air comes in. Why is it so warm? Well, because it's going to be a northwest wind. I'll explain that later. Right now we're looking for a 66 in Cuero in uh, Lavaca. We're looking for a 65 in Cuero with afternoon sun. You see it right about there. So the frontal system comes in after midnight, showers early in the day, clearing up later. Saturday and Sunday are good. And then the next one comes in on Monday. That is your seven day forecast reminding everybody we do have a QR code. We'd love for you to scan that. And if you do that, you can get Crossroads today right on your cell phone. Here's Karina. Thank you, Matt. Coming up next on 25 News Now at 5, we'll take a look at your stocks. Plus, some Kia and Hyundai mo models still remain vulnerable to car thieves. The details straight ahead. Taking a look at your stocks, the Dow up 10 points, the S&P 500 down 16 points, and the Nasdaq down 82 points, oil down 37 cents, closing at $72.33 a barrel. New data shows theft insurance claims for Hyundai and Kia shot up more than 
1,000% or rather 100% between 2020 and 2023. Some Hyundai and Kia models from 2015 to 2019 aren't equipped with basic prevention technology. Hyundai and Kia recently agreed to a $200 million settlement with millions of car owners regarding the lack of security software. Both automakers have been working alongside police departments to hand out steering locks to drivers affected models. Now, TGI Fridays is shutting down 36 underperforming locations around the U.S. The company did not release a list of closed locations, but reports indicate New Jersey is most affected with seven locations closed. There were also six locations reportedly closed in Massachusetts and five in New York, as well as some in five other states, including Texas. Prior to the closures, TGI Fridays had roughly 270 U.S. locations. The company said about 80 percent of total impacted employees received transfer opportunities. And of course, Texas has come up with a new way to fund community colleges that focuses on a student's success more so than enrollment. You can read the full story by the Texas Tribune on our CrossroadsToday.com website. And stay with us. We're going to take one last look at your forecast with Mac. Plus, the grandmother of Juneteenth received a gift after 80 years. Plus, here's a look at what's coming up on World News tonight right after 25 News Now at 5. News right now here in New York City. The subway, two trains colliding, dozens of injuries, people pulled from the tracks. The deadly school shooting, a student shooting several students and the principal. The Northeast bracing for a major winter storm. Potential snow totals coming up next. The woman who persuaded lawmakers to designate Juneteenth as a national holiday is getting a special gift. Opal Lee was forced to flee her family's home in Fort Worth after a racist mob set it on fire. She found out the land had been owned by Trinity Habitat for Humanity. Lee called Trinity CEO and asked to purchase it back, and they actually gave the land back to her free of charge. Plans for a future home for Lee have been drafted, and ground was broken just last October. And that is full circle. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the Juneteenth story is really a Texas story.
Oh, yeah, because it was Because they arrived here from the deep south, and they announced it, and it was several months after the Civil War had actually ended. So it's nice that, uh, you know, recognized who kept, kept this story going, kept it alive, uh, and now that she gets her property back, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, like I said, I, I, can, I can always count on you for a history I, I, lesson. I'm, Truly. I'm, I'm a history buff, I'm sorry. I, I read a lot, and I, I love knowing things, of course, of course. how they happened, and you know, how, how it all arrived. Well, and of course, weather-wise is the other thing I look at. Uh, <laughs> uh, the frontal system is coming in uh, tonight, folks, probably a little bit after midnight. It is moving rapidly. It's already in uh, Midland, Odessa. That means that, what, Sonora is next, then, uh, you know, Kerrville, and then it'll be moving through the I-35 corridor right about midnight. So uh, expect the rain to begin overnight, and tomorrow morning it should be on the soggy side. The good news is, is because it's moving faster than we earlier thought, it's going to clear out faster. So Friday afternoon and evening should be okay, and the weekend should be very nice until we get that next frontal system coming in on Monday. Alrighty, thank you, Mac, and thank you for being with us. We hope to see you back here tonight for 25 News Now at 6. World News Tonight with David Muir is up next.